think as Canadians, we're very familiar with the word sorry. Tell me if this has happened to you before. You、uh, go to the grocery store, somebody bumps into you, and then you're like, oh, sorry about that. Right, you're apologizing. Or maybe you grew up, I certainly grew up playing this game, this board game, Sorry, where the whole point you're trying to make it around the board and sometimes you knock other people off. They have to start over again. Sorry, sorry about that. You know, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> you're trying to win. Sometimes I listen to this、uh, morning briefing, this little news podcast, The Economist, and、uh, usually it's, it's a British journalist, right, who's speaking, and, and towards the end, occasionally, they'll make a correction. Like on Thursday, we spoke about Dr. So and so, who we said was a neurologist, but actually they're a nephrologist. Sorry, right? And they say it in that British accent, which makes it sound even less sincere and more pretentious. No offense to anybody who has a British accent. Or we've all heard these non apologies from politicians, right? I'm sorry if you misunderstood. What I said, and if you took offense, right, it's your fault. You didn't get it, or you were overly sensitive. But I wonder if one of the worst kinds of apologies is、uh, when somebody says sorry, and then they do the same thing over again, and then they say sorry, and they do the same thing again, and then they say sorry, and they're, they're like these repeat offenders, right? We all have people in our lives, family members, friends. Who do that over and over again? Maybe it's like, you know, they, they say they're gonna be there. They're gonna, you know, visit a, a family member in the nursing home and they don't show up.、Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I couldn't make it. And then the next time they also are a no show. And again and again. Or, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll clean up the mess in the garage. Sorry about that. And then it sits there for weeks. <laughs> and it's like, sorry, sorry. Ben, it's like, it's not, is this going to change? Or somebody gets angry. Yeah, sorry about that. And then the next day,、uh, they blow a gasket again. Again and again. Now, just to turn the tables for a second, sometimes we might be the ones who do this. And I'll say for myself,、uh, those of you who know me, one of my many character flaws is that I'm late for everything. As I live in this household, Companions of the Cross, a bunch of priests, and, and Sebastian, our seminarian. And we get together, we pray and eat meals together most days of the week. And almost on a daily basis, I'm late for prayer. In fact, as Companions of the Cross, we have this rule of life that we try to follow, our constitutions. And let me just read for you from rule number 13.2 this, this area under accountability. Here's the example that's given. If a member misses a community gathering or is late for it without permission, he should offer an apology at the next available opportunity. So I get the rule book thrown at me all the time. And I apologize over and over again, and yet nothing seems to change. I keep doing the same thing, I keep showing up late. And by the way, I'm sharing this with you. This is not something I'm proud of, I'm, I'm embarrassed. It's like I, I, I'm powerless to, to be on time. Forever in this life and the next, I'll be referred to as the late Father Simon. <laughs> But we know, don't we, intuitively, that you can't just say words, that's not enough. There needs to be some kind of concrete change,、uh, a behavior change to accompany that. Now, in our gospel today, we hear about this guy, Zacchaeus, who was a notorious sinner. He wasn't just a tax collector, he was the chief. I mean, this guy had climbed the ranks, he was in cahoots with the Romans, and he was running, he was managing a whole department of tax collectors who were all skimming off the top, so much so that he. Was rich. Now Jesus is passing through Jericho. He heals this blind guy. Word gets out, and Zacchaeus wants to see him. So he's got the physique of a hobbit. So he has to climb up a tree to get a good view. And he's, he's seeking Jesus, but even more so, Jesus is seeking him. And when Jesus gets there, he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, hurry down. I'm going to change my plans. Tonight, I'm staying at your place. I'm going to spend some intimate quality time with you and no one else. Now, Zacchaeus 
he hurries down and, and it has this profound effect on him because Jesus sees this guy. He, yes, he sees his sin. He sees his compromise. He sees his greed. And yet he sees a man who was lost and he loves him. Jesus loves the lost. And it has such a profound effect that, that Zacchaeus, he does two things. I think the first is implicit and the second is obvious. First, he repents, and then he makes reparation. So let's just unpack that real quickly. Repentance is genuinely saying, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Unqualified. And then reparation, think of the word repair. It's helping to repair the damage caused by our sin. Helping to, to bring healing. Helping to fix what was what was done as a, as a cause of our sin, some kind of concrete change. Now imagine if Zacchaeus was like, yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. And then he turns around and he keeps defrauding everybody else. It's like, how authentic was that? But actually he says right away, I'm going to give away half of my riches to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, I will re- repay them back four times, which was the maximum that the law demanded. So he makes this concrete reparation. We, we know this, that true repentance involves reparation. I'll give you a simple analogy. Maybe you've heard this before. So let's say you're playing baseball, and the baseball goes through the neighbor's window. It shatters it. So you go over to the neighbor, and you, you knock on the door. Benevolent neighbor comes to the door. You, you say, I'm so sorry we broke your window and he forgives you. So it's dealt with, right? Not entirely. You're forgiven. You've repented. But there's still the matter of the broken window, which needs to be repaired, right? So we know this, that true repentance involves reparation. And I think My invitation to all of us today is simple, that this week we take a little bit of quiet time in prayer and and go before God. Say, God, something like this, please show me an area of my life where I need to repent and make reparation. And just be open to what he might inspire. Maybe, yeah, we've taken something unjustly that we need to return. Perhaps we've damaged somebody's reputation and we need to try to restore it. Or maybe we've, uh, we've uh, been self-centered and we need to be other-centered, more generous. Or maybe we're late all the time and we need to show up on time out of respect for everyone else and, and their time. So whatever that is. And by the way, this is not just about my, my power, my ability to fix it, but to repent before Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help to repair the damage that was done. And he loves to do this because he loves the lost. And I love how this, this gospel is summarized. Jesus' entire mission in the last line. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. And this, in fact, is what we want to be about as a parish. A place where people who feel lost can come and be found in Jesus, caught in his love and be able to receive the help to start to repair the damage and the hurt from their past. Now at this time, I'd like to invite up Sebastian, who's going to share his story of being lost and being found in Jesus. So come on up, brother. So my name is Sebastian Muggeridge. I am also known at this parish right now as Seabass the Little Lamb, as as I was introduced by Father Alex in my first two weeks here. And my formation director reminded me that in order to become the shepherd, you must first become the sheep. So I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony about how I became, I was a lost sheep, and how I came back to God. Now, I'm from Ottawa uh, originally, and I grew up with four brothers and one sister. I have a picture here from Halloween many, many, many moons ago. 
And my parents brought us up. My mom actually made all those costumes, by the way. It was incredible. But my, my parents brought me up in the Catholic faith. And I grew up with an understanding that I, I, that I had a Catholic faith that was, was nourishing me in, in my life. And then we went to Catholic school. We prayed the rosary together as a family. And I knew that I could go to confession when I, when I sinned. But growing up, I had an experience, and it was no, no fault of anyone, that led me to believe that my worth and my well-being depended on what other people thought of me. And I lived this way, and, and in high school, I drifted away from my faith, and in university, I, I did as well. I started partying and drinking, and I started to put my value and my well-being in what other people thought of me. So I, I created this life for myself, and I was rich in the things of this world. I had a great university degree. I was, I was in nursing, and I was, I was nearly at the top of my class. I had lots of friends, and I had this relationship with a young lady, a beautiful young lady, who I was very much uh, attached to. And on the outside, everything I seemed to have together but on the inside, I was actually miserable. And it was around this time that I got connected with some missionaries from Catholic Christian Outreach, which is called CCO. And they're on campuses across Canada. And I remember I, I, I avoided these people because I was afraid that I was going to have to change my life. I was afraid that I would have to end this relationship with, with this girl. And I knew from my Catholic upbringing that I was not living God's plan for human sexuality. And this relationship became the center of my life. My, my worth, my value, my identity, my well-being became wrapped up in this relationship with this girl. And I was miserable. And I remember a friend of mine, a roommate that was involved with CCO, he, he knew what I was struggling with, and he, and he said to me one day, Sebastian, what's going to make you happy? What's going to make you happy? And I, I gave this answer, you know, like having a great job, like great career, and finding, finding someone to spend the rest of my life with. And he said, Sebastian, yeah, those things will make you kind of happy. But there's only one thing that can truly satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. He said, that's a relationship with God. And he invited me to come to an annual retreat that CCO was running. And honestly, I, I knew that I needed something. I, I didn't even know if God was real. And I came and I met these university students that were joyful, happy, excited. And I was like, well, I was like why, why are they happy? I, I, I'm miserable. And it was at that retreat, on the final night of the retreat, I decided to return to the sacrament of reconciliation, something I knew growing up that when I was in sin, I knew I needed to do. And I was in sin. There was areas of my sin in my, in sin in my life that I, I needed to confess. But I was scared because I was afraid what this priest would think about me. And like I said, my, my well-being was wrapped up in what other people thought of me. I was afraid what God would even think of me. And I remember I nervously confessed my sins. And I remember the priest looked up at me and he said, Sebastian, God is so happy that you're here right now. He's been waiting for you to come back to him. And for me, the, it was this experience of, of, of being loved by God, coming back to, to the Father, like, like the son in the prodigal son's story. And I was forgiven of my sins, and, and I, I felt this peace. And I, I came back to the prayer night that was happening, and a CCO missionary came up to me. It was actually Father Simon's brother, Jeremy, who was working for CCO at the time, and he invited me to pray to invite Jesus to be the center of my life. And it, it was here that it occurred to me. I had put, been putting things, human relationships, in the center of my life, and I was miserable. And this was my opportunity 
to put God, to put Jesus, Jesus who is a human being but also God, at the center of my life. So I prayed. Jesus, I invite you to be at the center of my life. I'm sorry for my sins. I invite you in. And I didn't feel anything dramatic or anything crazy, but it was, it was really, I just kept praying this prayer. I kept praying this prayer every day, and I had experienced a, a deeper peace, a deeper joy in my life, and I came to this realization that my whole life was a gift, and I knew, and I knew that I knew that it was a gift from God. I just knew it. I experienced this, yeah, this deeper joy, this deeper peace. And this is the part of the story where, where I'd love to say that, and they all lived happily ever after. And I, I've honestly, I've told that story before. But the reality is that in this point in my life, I was still in this relationship, and I was still living in sin. I had made a repentance. I had, invited Je- I had repented, invited Jesus into my life, but I wasn't able to make reparation. I wasn't able to make any change in my life. And it, it was even like almost a year later that I ended up in confession again for the same sins over and over again. And the priest in the confessional, he actually challenged me and he said, Sebastian, God forgives you. If you're truly sorry, God forgives you. But you need to change your life. And it occurred to me, he, he was right. But the problem was, I, I, I had tried to change my life. I, I, I tried everything. I, I, I said, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just work harder. I'll do more. I'll, I'll, I'll. But it didn't work. I kept falling into sin. I couldn't do it. And it's then that I realized I needed help. I need God's help. You know, I, so I talked to this priest, and I actually asked him to help me, help me through this. And I, I had some Catholic friends that, that I was able to help, to help support me. And eventually, I made a decision to end this relationship. And gradually, I started to experience freedom in my life. My life started to change. I was actually even able to make amends to this person that, that I had been in a relationship for so long, for all the harm that I had done make reparation. And as I reflect back on this experience, I was so afraid to lose something by giving, inviting Jesus into this area of my life and to change my life, to give up this relationship. But the reality is that I was actually lost. But Jesus found me, and I found Jesus. I found hope. I found freedom. I found peace. I even found my vocation to the priesthood, which never would have happened. And I'm not perfect now. I'm still lost in some areas of my life. But if there's just one person here today who feels lost, who feels like there is no hope for them, that you've tried and you tried and you still struggle and you still sin. If you feel lost, that means Jesus is coming to find you. Because that's why Jesus came, to seek out and to save the lost.